age of steam has gone. But the romance has remained as more and more steam locomotives are restored. And in so doing, creating a nostalgia for times when travel was more an adventure than a chore. The world's most famous steam locomotive is without doubt the Flying Scotsman. Locomotive's visit to Australia during the nation's bicentennial celebrations in 1988 has earned it the distinction of being the only steam engine to speed its way across three continents. More than that, its sea voyage to Australia and return would make it the first ever locomotive to circumnavigate the globe. From the moment it settled on Australian rails, it was surrounded by crowds, all wanting to be part of this history-making trip. A full six months was allowed for the visit to Australia to permit every rail enthusiast in the country to see this most famous engine. The Flying Scotsman has a fascinating history. At times glorious, at times ignominious. The London and North Eastern Railway locomotive began service in February 1923 and a year later was christened the Flying Scotsman and given her now famous number, 4472. She was named after the train which regularly ran the trip through the north of England into Scotland. Throughout the 1920s, every morning at 10, the locomotive would leave King's Cross Station in central London for the express journey to Edinburgh. The most illustrious day in her long career undoubtedly occurred on November the 30th, 1934 was during a time trial through Leeds on that day that she was clocked at 100 miles per hour, the first steam engine to officially crack the tongue. The Flying Scotsman continued in service until 1968, when the engine was sold, and it was then used for privately sponsored excursions around Britain. Her new owner decided on a visit to America, a visit which began in triumph and ended almost in disaster. The cost of maintaining her in America could not keep pace with revenue. The Flying Scotsman was broke. The creditors moved in. And had it not been for the quick intervention of a British committee headed by Mr. W. McAlpine, the engine would have been sold for scrap. The debts were paid off, and in 1972 the engine was loaded aboard the California Star and welded to its deck. The Flying Scotsman was going home. Home she went, through the Panama Canal and across the wild Atlantic. After being unloaded during the snowstorm in Liverpool, the engineers confirmed that she could travel under her own steam, and she made a triumphal progress through England. By 1973, she was ready for work and began her life again, running holiday excursions. But it was the plans for Australia's bicentennial that saw a request being made for another overseas trip. Approval was granted, providing all costs could be underwritten. Money was raised in Australia, 
and the middle of 1988 saw Austin organizer Walter Scutchbury in England watching final preparations being made for the journey down under. Local television news found Scotty's volunteer minders giving the old girl a complete overhaul and a new paint job. They seemed pleased to be sharing in her adventure. Oh no, I'm going out to Australia. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, first steam locomotive ever to circumnavigate the world and go to three continents. I think it's a wonderful opportunity and uh, not only is the engine looking forward to it, but all the volunteers who you've already seen kicking around working on it are all looking forward to going as well. By July, all was in readiness, and the 65-year-old engine was loaded for the month-long trip to Australia. Well, I've lived with it so long that it's become part of the family and uh, it's, I treat it as a friend and it knows me every time I go along to see her and uh, yeah, one of my favourite girlfriends. I think while there are sufficient people around who enjoy riding behind steam locomotives, the steam locomotive will continue. to a human being that mankind's ever made. It's got everything a human being has. It's got lungs that breathe and limbs that move and it's got a mind that can think. Most people have got an affection for them, uh, and even youngsters who could never have travelled behind steam locomotives in their lives are now busy with them and enjoying working amongst them as, as a, an experience. The rival of the Flying Scotsman in Sydney was unlike any other. The only crane in Australia with sufficient capacity to unload the huge loco was the Titan from the naval dockyard in Sydney, and it was an exacting operation. One wrong move could have seen 60 tons of British rail history plunging to the bottom of Sydney Harbour. The engine seemingly had suffered no ill effects from the long sea voyage. And once steamed up, it was ready and keen to explore the Australian countryside. A whistle stop at Albury on the New South Wales Victorian border gave the engineers a chance to top up the oil. and The locals to record the visit of a legend to their town.
Pulling just a water tender and a couple of vans, the locomotive took off down the standard gauge track to Melbourne to begin its national tour. Flashing past the rows of eucalypts running parallel to the Hume Highway was a far cry from its regular trips through the tranquil English countryside. Once stabled among the diesel engines in Melbourne's South Dynan Shed, a full lubrication and maintenance check. Executives from Mobile Oil were on hand to give her the once-over. The systems of lubrication, you've got a mechanical lubricator here which is handling uh, bearings and that on the inner side. Oh, that's, that's the main, main, main bearings. bearings and it's a lighter oil in that one. And in foreign of that, you've got in here, because this engine's a bit different. In the normal operation of locomotives out here in Australia now that are running, the majority of them run with a hydrostatic lubricator. The oil is mixed by sight in a sight glass you can see injected into the steam. That's right. This engine oil is pumped by a mechanical lubricator to the cylinders and mixed there. And, and, and that's all in this. 
Oh, it's a fair bit. What, what would this go through? On the, uh, on the well, on top of what I would... Uh, In there, that's purely for your cylinder fluid. Purely for the cylinder fluid. And that lubricator that, uh, that fills up the weak uh, lubricator. Yeah, it's, a, it's an actual set of uh, valves in there, and as the engine, as that rod moves backwards and forwards, it's connected to the valve rod. Yes. And that pumps the oil through. It's actually pumped in a pressure. So it's a slowly rotating pump, which every click pumps a squirt of oil. Uh, yeah, positive fluid. Yeah. Well, that goes into the wick lubricator. That goes in, no, that goes direct to the cylinders on the like steam the line. Going. Probably about 20,000 miles. We'll finish up running. Yes, right. Is this side coming up on the cross end? Yes. Two pipes there, and they drip through. Two others coming out that will feed onto the cylinder cross cylinder piston rod, and the valve rod in here is the side. There's an oil drip feed just in front of the gland. And that's only regulated by the size by of the, the wicks. wicks. Yeah, the wicks regulate that. Mobile Super Cylinder Oil is the only oil which meets the high speed and heavy steam requirements of the Scotsman. The distinctive qualities of the oil are explained by Mobile's chief engineer, Tony Fress. The main difference between the car and the steam engine is the temperature of the cylinders. You may think that a car would run at a fairly high temperature, but in fact it is water cooled, whereas the steam cylinder is set to run as hot as possible. You want a very high temperature so the steam doesn't condense into water as it goes through the cylinder. So the oil as a lubricant has to withstand a much higher cylinder temperature than in fact a car does. It's extremely high viscosity. The SAE 50, which you may remember as the top end of most automotive lubricants, the viscosity of that is about half the viscosity of the extra Heckler super cylinder oil used in the steam cylinder lubrication. The steam cylinder lubrication is in fact compounded, which means it has a vegetable fat added to it around 10%, possibly 15%. So the oil will cling to the cylinder walls in the presence of steam and water. It's carried in with the steam, carried through into the cylinder, through the feed lines, into the valve chest and into the cylinder with the steam. And the compounding helps it cling to the wall. Now, the greater amount of compounding you have, the better is for the lubrication. But in fact, this reduces the oxidation stability of the oil. And the oil will carbon up much faster, causing deposits on the uh, piston cylinders, the piston walls, and the valve chest, valve gear, and so on. So there's a very careful balance that has to be struck. But again, you have a slight benefit in that the steam system has a separate lubricant for the big end bearings on the locomotive compared to a car where you have one lubricant that has to do the whole job. Now another interesting thing is the big end bearings on the locomotive are lubricated with a lighter oil than the steam cylinder oil. They each have their own reservoir which is sealed with a cork. The oil is poured in and then the cork placed in on top of it to keep the dirt out. There's a slight non-return valve effect in the cork to allow air breathing as the oil is drained down through into the bearings. While the loco is stabled in the Melbourne yards, for Victorian rail employees, there's the chance to have a photograph to show their grandchildren. The Flying Scotsman's first scheduled public appearance is to coincide with the open day at Melbourne's Spencer Street Station to celebrate Aus Team 88. As part of the Festival of Steam, many of the restored locomotives from Victoria and other states are making their way to Melbourne. The Green 1210, one of the 12 class, was from 1913 the first locomotive to work the branch line from Queen Beanne to Canberra, now the nation's capital. From 1962 it had been retired and mounted on stone outside the Canberra railway station. In 1986, 
the Australian Capital Territory Railway Historical Society returned the 12 to the tracks. On her trip to Melbourne, 1210 is accompanied by one of the few remaining 30 class tank engines in Australia. It was bought by the 3112 Preservation Group in 1986 and now runs as well as she ever did. The two New South Wales visiting locomotives are met near the border and accompanied to Melbourne by the Victorian J-Class 515 with its distinctive red smoke deflecting plates. The 515 is probably the most recent Victorian engine to be restored and only resumed service in 1988. Acting as good hosts should, another Victorian engine has waited for the next visitor from the north. The R-Class 761. It wasn't long before her charge arrived to be accompanied to Melbourne on the parallel standard gauge track. The huge 38 class 3801 is probably the best known loco in Australia. It has visited every mainland capital city in Australia during the bicentennial year. The big green loco served the New South Wales Railways from 1943 until it was withdrawn from service in 1965. But being the glamour engine it was, authorities decided that it should be maintained for special events. And the bicentennial certainly was a special event. The Scotsman had been through. Now the locals had again to get their vantage points to see the exhibition trains come through.
Australian rail enthusiasts take delight in restoring the old steam locomotive. Teams of volunteers have contributed thousands of man hours to have these beauties steaming all over the extensive rail network. Finally, all are assembled at Spencer Street for the open day. The road around the station is closed to traffic, and 100,000 people cram the concourses to see Scotty and the rest of the restored locos. Steam is alive. After a day of rest, the Flying Scotsman is now ready to perform the task for which she has been brought the 18,000 kilometers. She's ready to start pulling the train. From now, for the next six months, in every state of Australia, the Flying Scotsman will pull train after train of well-wishers. This journey is from Melbourne to Seymour and return. Like every trip the train will make, it is booked out. The steam train lovers can always be identified. They normally carry two cameras, and during the journey they wear protective goggles. That way they can lean out of the window and not have their eyes clogged by smoke and grit. On the footplate, the Scotsman operates at a boiler pressure of 210 pounds per cubic inch for a full head of steam. The fireman needs to shovel around a ton of coal every hour to maintain that pressure. Into the small firebox hatch it goes. To open the whole hatch would create a heat so intense that the crew would be unable to stay in the cabin. Australia's road speed limit is 100 kilometers an hour, or 60 miles an hour. On this run, the locomotive has no trouble in leaving all the road traffic behind. The word had got about that the Scotsman was coming through. All along the route, the country folks staked their claim to the best vantage points and waited patiently for a glimpse of the train as she passed.
wanted to see more, a ride on the turntable to face it in the right direction for the return trip to Melbourne.
Organizers of the visit planned a series of day trips. The demand for seats was so great that the number of trips had to be more than doubled. While most of the Australian steam locomotives are two-cylinder, the Scotsman's real claim to fame for the enthusiasts is that she has three cylinders. The third position between the other two with a large driving crank inside the main driving wheels. It's this extra cylinder which gives the Scotsman her additional speed capacity. Back in Melbourne, a special visit from Bill McAlpine and a chance to catch up on the locomotive's adventures. Interesting to see it sailing around the corner of the pier. For six months, the Flying Scotsman visits every mainland capital, from Brisbane in the north, right across the Nullarbor Plain to Perth in the west. It's a journey no other engine would attempt. But for the Flying Scotsman, LNER number 4472. It's just a way of continuing to write itself into the history books as the world's most famous steam locomotive. Thank you. 